Well, good morning, everybody. So glad you're here. Just a couple of things to remember. Our Super Summer Bible Conference for our senior adults is next Sunday, 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock in Sanders Hall. We're going to be studying 2 Peter, and our teachers are Dr. Tim Deal, Casey Winstead, and Gary Inman. You need to come here to the summit table and sign up, or you can call in that in the church office. August 29th, we're going to be praying for our, our schools and our government and for our school year. Just come to Bryant Football Stadium at 6 p.m. and we're gonna worship the Lord together and just have a, a great time. There's some information about that on our bulletin page this morning as well. And speaking of schools, this afternoon, we're gonna ask you to prayer walk a school near your home or a school that your child goes to. There are times and schedules out on the summit table and we hope you go by and pick one of those up and just share just a few minutes this afternoon of prayer walk into your school. It's gonna be a great year, but we need to pray for our kids, we need to pray for our, our faculty and all those involved. Again, welcome to our services. We're so glad you're here. Let's worship the Lord together. Join with us, stand as we worship together this morning. Lift your voice to the Lord. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening in this place your glory on our face looking to the sky descending like a cloud you're standing with us now See you 
open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Hey, I don't know what your morning has been like. It may have been great. It may have been a little struggle today, but I hope that's the prayer of your heart. God, show us your glory today in this place. God, as we worship you, God, show us who you are. Reveal to us. Open up the heavens. He has done great things. See that? Come, let us worship our King. And come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. Come see what our Savior has done. Come see how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Yes, he has. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. He's been faithful through every storm. Sing it with us. You've been faithful through every song, and you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Yes, God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Sing that again. Sing hallelujah, God, he's above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. God, you've done great things. Oh, hero of
Amen. Our God does do great things. Our God does do great things. Great things our God does. Great things. There we go. Hey, you guys just needed to really drip on every word I was going to say. Our God does great things. Amen. We're so excited that you're here this morning. Uh, we realize that many of you are in person, many of you are online, and we're so grateful for that. We know that uh, today, for many families, is the last day of freedom. For tomorrow starts the prison of school. We're really excited about this next season in ministry, and we know that school is starting. We look forward to that. For many families, they're finally like, we made it through the summer. And we can send our kids on. Or some of you are like, oh, we really are going to hate letting our kids go. Wherever you are, we know that today you're in worship. And we hope that as you're here, you're receiving and renewing what the Lord might have for you. Well, we know that some of you may be new to Geyer Springs. Maybe uh, you're, you're a guest, either online or in person. And uh, one of our values here at Geyer Springs is we, we value authentic relationships. And so in that, we want to get to know you. And I know in a crowd this size, or maybe you're at home, it's like, how do I get to know the church? And how does the church get to know me? Well, take out your cell phone, and you can text in to kind of check in. We want to get to know you. Take out your phone, text to the number 94000, 94000. If you're a guest with us today, text the word discover. And what will happen as you text the word discover, you're going to get a response back and kind of cue you in on a few things here at Gary Springs. A great way for you to kind of connect with us as someone who hasn't been connected to Gary Springs. And so we want you to do that. Could be that this morning in person or online that you are already uh, connected, but we want to get to make sure that we know that you're here. And so if you're a regular attender, you take out your cell phone, you text the number 94,000, but text the word GSFBC, and you're going to receive a response back and have an opportunity to take a look at our Sunday bulletin. You can also reply back with a prayer request and some other things. We want to get to know you throughout your season here at our church. And so help us do that because we believe authentic relationships is a two-way street. So if you reach out, we promise. We're going to reach right back out to you. You heard Brother Max talk a little bit about uh, prayer walk as we launch into school. Certainly we're thoughtful of schools, but we want to be prayerful over schools. And so this afternoon, you, can, you are invited to go to the school where your kids may attend, or maybe there's a school near your neighborhood. We invite you to go, and we invite you to pray. We've made it really easy for you this morning. Online, you can go to our Sunday hub at gsfbc.org slash Sunday. You can see some information about prayer walk. You download that guide. It's a great place to get information. Also, that prayer guide is also available in the main lobby areas and hallways. And so pick one of those guides up, download one of those guides, go to your local school. We provided some suggested times as to when to go so that you can see other believers from our church there as well. Uh, what a great way to support schools, support administrators, and to support our community through prayer. So we invite you to do that this afternoon uh, starting at 3 o'clock, and you'll see those times available on their prayer guide. Well, this morning is a wonderful time for our church. Uh, this morning we have the opportunity to kind of increase our staff, and so I've asked Pastor Dave to come and make a presentation this morning. This is wife Abby, daughter Mariah, and son Ram. Uh, some of you may recognize Adam. Adam grew up here at Geyer Spring. Well, you wouldn't recognize him. He was a curly-headed little boy back then. What happened? I got married. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Not touching that, brother. Not touching it. Adam grew up here at Geyer Springs. Adam actually uh, served on our staff. He was the first uh, preteen minister when we made the decision to go to preteen ministry. First one to do that. Uh, several years ago, he left here, went to seminary, went to serve in some other local churches. I'll be honest, I did not keep up with Adam uh, very well during that time. But as we um, began to talk about our, our new vision, what we shared back in June about planting uh, these different sites where we could get the gospel out, and we began to think about uh, having the mission pastor position vacant, what we would do about that. We felt like we needed to find a guy who could be both a mission and mobilization pastor, could mobilize the church, could mobilize plants, could help us get the gospel message out to as many points as possible. Well, Adam, uh, the week I preached that message, Adam happened to call and he just wanted to talk about the message. And as we talked, it dawned on me 
this guy understands what we're trying to do. And Adam, I'll be honest, I told Miller right after I got off the phone, man, I didn't remember him being that articulate and that intelligent. <laughs> but Adam has thoroughly studied some of the same principles of growth that we're looking at. Adam uh, understands all that. And the more we talk, the more we realize, hey, God has placed this guy right in our lap. And, and we love, and you know this, if you look at the composition of our staff, we love calling guys back. Guys that know us, that know our DNA, that, that uh, want to be a part of the work that God is doing here. So Adam's here this morning. Uh, he is here in view of a call as our pastor of uh, missions and mobilization. I wanted you to have a, a few minutes to hear from him. Adam's going to share about his relationship with Christ and his passion for ministry. It's been a special day. Um, I was thinking this morning, 21 years ago, our family walked through the doors of this church. And I'll never forget going upstairs and then being involved in student ministry, meeting Jason Miller for the first time, getting a bottle of candy. And there was a gift in there. There was a, like a small nail cross that was in there. And then, um, man, just really coming in and feeling loved and welcome. And that was 21 years ago. Um, Jason, I don't even know this. I, I, I didn't even share this with you. That when that happened and when you came over to our house that night, um, that nail cross meant something to me more than anything. I even put it on the back end of my door, and that's, that hung there until I graduated from, from high school and college. And, uh, uh, and then my parents remodeled the house, and they took it down. But all that to say, 21 years ago, I stepped foot into this church, and it's always been my home church. And this is a special moment for me because when I think back even to 2006, when I started to graduate high school, uh, you sent me on a camp. You sent me to a camp in Colorado, and it was on that camp that the Lord reached my heart. See, I grew up in church all my life, uh, but like many of us, culturally, we understood the, the processes and the, the religion that's behind it, and we hear messages, and we understand it's good to pray and it's good to read the Bible, but for me, my heart was still so hard. It was still full of pride, arrogance, and I understood the ins and out of church. And I love being here and I love the people that I was surrounded with because they were good people and they encouraged me, they prayed for me, they invested in me. But for the first time on that camp, I truly met God. Uh, God reached the part of my heart that was hardened, the part that was arrogant, the one that was still holding on and saying, man, this world is all about you. It's all about what you can do. And this Jesus thing on the side is just to help you look better and look like a good person, all of those things started to fall away, and I was exposed for the first time, and I was broken. And as a, uh, as a student on the back row in the middle of this worship service, hearing the gospel, and knowing God was calling me, and the Holy Spirit was just pulling me, I knew that I needed Jesus. And so uh, not wanting to cry in front of all of my friends, not wanting to make just a big scene, I did the worst thing that you could possibly do for a student pastor, sorry Jason, I got up and I ran away. <laughs> I ran and I remember finding myself just on top of this, this bridge that's right where the Arkansas River starts in Colorado. And I remember just looking up at this Colorado sky and just thinking, man, I'm so small. But remembering the gospel and remembering what I just heard and, and knowing that God wanted to reconcile me, I began to just open up my heart. And I began to pray to God for the first time. I began to just lay myself down, and on that night, I gave my life to Christ. I was foolish to think that, man, this is something that I need to keep to myself, and I did. I kept it to myself for a long time, and it wasn't until I was in college that, that God began to break me on that. As I began to learn and, and grow in my walk with Christ for the first time, I mean, I was like a new Christian that just needed somebody to invest in him. And so Lynn Lloyd, this, this guy that was at the BCM, looked at me and said, man, God's got a special calling on you. Let me help with that. And he began to disciple me. He began to train me. He began to just walk me through the Bible. And as I began to understand more and more about what God was calling me to, man, I was convicted that, that I'd never even publicly displayed that in front of the rest of uh, my friends and my family and to the world. And I remember calling up Dave. Dave, I don't even know if you remember this. Calling up Dave and saying, hey, I need to be baptized. I was baptized as a kid. But there was, no, there was no point in my life where I'd surrendered over to Christ. And so I just, I got in the baptistry. 
And I remember humbling myself and calling up this church and saying, hey, can I come back home and get baptized? It was on a Sunday night right there in that baptistry. I went up there and I remember saying, man, this is the point where I am totally surrendering and I'm totally obedient to Christ. And from this point on, man, I'm just, I'm going to live sold out for Jesus. So I got baptized here and it wasn't long after that that you called me back here to intern. And if there's still some pictures around of those days, I'm just going to ask, can we burn those? Can we get rid of those? Those were, those were crazy days, long curly hair, don't know what I was doing, and hopefully those never come back. But I interned here, and, and God began to work a, a heart of ministry in my life. And, and it wasn't until I finished college that I came back here and got a chance to really cut my teeth in ministry. And it was through that year that God even affirmed, man, there's something here that I want you to do for the rest of your life. And you acknowledge that as well. And I remember on a Sunday night as well, being drawn in here and y'all licensed me to ministry. Man, that's the day that I look back, man, that was, that was such a great day. Y'all laid hands on me, you surrounded me and you said, we affirm your calling and we license you to ministry. And God took me to new places after that. I went and served as a student pastor in Louisville, Kentucky and began my seminary journey at, at Southern Seminary. And then in 2014, I moved out to Cross Church and served as a student pastor there for five years. In the last couple of years, I've been serving as a campus pastor at Shallow Christian Schools in partnership with Cross Church as well. But today, man, this is, this is a great day. Uh, over the last year, my, my family has just really been praying and seeking the Lord. Hey, what's next for our life? What is our heart really burned for? What is really Jesus calling us to do next? And church planning and church revitalization was at the forefront of that. And we began to pray. And through that last year, this, this whole journey, God just aligned our hearts with where Guy is at. And it's so cool to think. I would have never thought a year ago that God would bring me back to this place. But this is special. Because not only is this my home, not only is this my church, not only have you licensed me and sent me out, but you're calling me back as well. And I can't be more excited about what God has for the future of Guy and for this region. I truly believe that the next step of Geyer is going to be of great health as well as great reach. And so as y'all consider this, as y'all vote on this, uh, know that we're prayerful through this as well, and this is a great honor to even be here. So thank you for considering me. Dave, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Adam. All right, we're gonna let uh, Adam and Abby and the, the kids head upstairs. Yeah, you can go ahead and thank Adam. <clears throat> They're going to head upstairs and share with the uh, modern service crowd in the venue in just a minute. We're going to vote. Let me mention, if you're watching online, uh, we want you to have opportunity to vote as well. And the way that you do that is go to gsfbc.org slash Sunday. That takes you to our uh, Sunday hub, and right on the top, you'll see a spot where you can uh, place your vote. We'd ask you to do that by the end of the service, since we have to vote here and upstairs and online at 9.30 and online at 11. It'll be about uh, 12.30, 1 o'clock that we will send a church-wide email out uh, letting you know the result of that vote. But if those of you online would make sure you do that by the end of the service, uh, that will help us. All right, so for those of you here in the house, uh, we are asking you to consider calling Adam as our pastor of missions and mobilization. That means he will do what we've been doing, he will oversee what we've been doing missionally, uh, locally, nationally, and internationally, and he will also be responsible to help mobilize as we begin to move out and start new work. So I would ask you this morning, if you would vote that we uh, call Adam, if you would simply raise your hand for me. All right, put those down, and is there anyone uh, opposed to calling Adam as pastor of mission and mobilization? And I see none. All right. Thank you so much. It's going to be an exciting venture as we, uh, we go forward. And it's just been amazing to me how God has brought Adam across our path and led us in this. So thank you this morning for that. John, come and lead us in worship. Church, let me invite you to stand with us as we can. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this. 
this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can sing. Yes, our hearts can stay. Ever once did we ever walk alone? Ever once did you feel us on our own? You are faithful, God. You are faithful. Healing on this battleground. Seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. to his faithfulness in this room. Amen. Through the years you've experienced it, you've seen it, and um, it's been on display in my life personally as well and through the people of his church. I've also seen how God is always at work in his people. Um, regardless of what we may see when we enter this room, uh, God is always at work. And sometimes I know I've questioned that at times, but uh, I've learned beyond his faithfulness, not to doubt his plan or his purpose, that God is always making a way. Isaiah 43, 1 through 3 says, but now this is what the Lord says, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In this scripture, God's reminding his people, the Israelites, how much he cares for them. And when you skip to verse 16, it says, This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wig. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. It says, now it springs up. 
Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and the streams in the wasteland. God's reminding his people. God reminds us that he is the one who makes a way. He's the one who parted the sea. For us to remember whether we're in need, whether we're in the want, what we have everything that we need. God is on his throne. He knows God is at work and he is always making a way for his people. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. Sing it with this church. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. at work. He is making the way. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you work. Stop working. 
Father, we worship you first and foremost because you alone are worthy. You are the only true and living God. There's not a God like you. There's not a God close to you. There's not a God that could compare to you because you're the only true and living God. And you are worthy of our worship. And so we offer our worship this morning. Father, we also come out of gratitude and thankfulness because you're so faithful. We've seen again and again how you have worked and how you have moved in our behalf individually and corporately. And God, we thank you for your faithfulness. And Father, I lift up. There are some here this morning, some in the sound of my voice that are in struggle, in trial, in storm. I pray that if they belong to you, if they're your child, they be reminded today of your faithfulness. Would you just pour that out over them and give them comfort and assurance. Father, thank you for the privilege we have of gathering in this place to worship you, to hear from you, and to obediently be the people that you have called us to be. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I want to thank you uh, for your prayers and concerns over the last several weeks, um, your uh, sentiments, um, checking in on us. Luann and I are doing uh, very well. You know that we have both have had COVID. Um, we didn't struggle a lot with that beyond uh, fatigue, but uh, we're doing very well. And, and I felt like I needed to give you an update this morning. Maybe it's not necessary, but I felt like I owed you that. Uh, you probably know four weeks ago, uh, I actually was prepared uh, Thursday afternoon, excited, had written what I think was one of the greatest messages I've ever written and was ready to preach on Sunday. And on Friday, Pastor Jason quarantined me because I had, been, had a significant exposure to COVID and I was not happy. I let him know I was not happy. In fact, I hate to admit this, this is really childish. I actually drove up here to the church that morning and took a picture of myself out on the parking lot just to tell him I'm here. But I sat home and listened and pouted as Brad, Pastor Brad did an excellent job preaching my text that morning. Um, I do appreciate Pastor Jason's wisdom. He has had a load on him in handling all of our COVID response. And uh, he was very wise in quarantining me because I did come down with COVID the next week. I was home for two weeks. Uh, once that quarantine ended, I was uh, here in the office involved in daily ministry, but I noticed I was having... Um, some trouble studying and focusing. Now, I don't know if you know this, unless you're a Sunday school teacher, but you don't write a lesson, you don't write a sermon in half a day. There's a lot of uh, reading and studying and, and synthesizing information. And I actually told Jason last Sunday, and again this Sunday, hey, I, I'm up Sunday, I'm, I'm good, uh, I'm, I'm ready to preach. But I literally have had great difficulty with, with comprehension and retention. Now, if you had previously had COVID and told me about COVID brain or brain fog, I, I wouldn't have done it to your face, but I probably would have kind of snickered behind your back and thought, well, that's, that's ridiculous. I believe it. Now, my doctor has told me this is normal. Not everybody has that with COVID, but it's normal for some COVID patients. He told me my cognitive function will get back to normal levels. I realize in saying that, I've opened myself up to all kinds of jokes and jabs about my cognitive function and normal levels. Bring it on while my reflexes are slow, okay? So um, here's where we are. Pastor Brad is going to be preaching this week. I appreciate the extra work that Pastor Brad and Pastor Jason have done uh, filling in these last few weeks. Pastor Brad is going to be preaching this week. Next week, I'm actually going to be gone uh, on vacation several months ago. Uh, we planned with our children. They got all their schedules worked out where we could all be together. And we just didn't feel like that we would uh, be wise to change that plan up because we didn't know when that would happen again. So I'll be out next week. But I look forward to being back uh, in this pulpit. Can't tell you how hard it is to be in this place and not preach. I look forward to being back in this pulpit uh, on the 29th and sharing the Word of God with you. Now let me ask you to join me in thanking both Pastor Jason and Pastor Brad for all their extra work. this week since we're not having Sunday school to go ahead and go till noon
to give everybody their full money's worth. In all seriousness, though, I am not going until noon today, but we will give a proper amount of time to handle this text. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 10, the gospel according to John chapter 10. A few years ago, I went out duck hunting early one morning, and it was a bitterly cold morning with a friend out in some flooded timber. In fact, it was so cold, we actually had to break ice to get where we were going. Some ducks started working, and I shot one, and it fell a few yards away, and I didn't have a retriever to go fetch it. I was the dog. And so I headed over to get the duck, and when I did, I slipped, and some cold water poured down into my waders. Well, I went back to my friend. He had driven that day, and I said, hey, can I get your keys, go back to your truck, and change clothes? And so he handed me his keys, and I headed back to the truck. Well, on my way back to the truck, I actually stepped into a really deep hole, and water began to rapidly rush into my waders, and I didn't know what to do, but I frantically began to try to swim in waders. That does not work out well. But in the Lord's providence, there was a tree nearby that I grabbed, and I clung to this tree for my dear life. At that point, I had dropped my bag that had all my shotgun shells, my knives, my calls, my license, all at the bottom of this flooded timber. I lodged my shotgun up into the tree, and I tried to pull myself up, but here's the catch. My waders were full of water, and there was no way I was going to be able to do that. So I unsnapped my waders, snapped them onto the branches, pulled myself out of the waders and up into the tree. I thought this day could not get any worse until I realized that I had dropped my friend's keys into the water. So I began to cry. I mean, literally, I was crying in this tree, soaking wet in 30-degree weather in the middle of nowhere. And then I began to frantically call for my friend. So as I called for my friend, he began to make his way over to me, which actually took a while because he couldn't find me. And when he finally got to me, he was unable to come help get me out of the tree because it was all over his head as well. So I had nothing else to do but to make a swim for it. So I jumped in this water and swam towards him. When I got to him, he pulled me up from my swimming position onto my feet. As I'm standing there onto my feet, if you've ever worn waders, you realize that is your shoes. And I had to walk out of there barefoot. But it didn't matter. My body was completely numb at this point anyway. So we're headed back to some dry land. And when we finally get to the dry land, his idea was to put me into his truck, turn it on, warm me up, and also give me a dry change of clothes. Now here was the problem. He just found out I had dropped the keys in the water. So he pivoted and began to pull off some of my wet clothes and give me some of his dry clothes. Now I have to rewind the story just a bit. The evening before, I told Katie, I have a great pair of waders they keep me dry, but they're really thin, and so I get cold. And so I have to bundle up to the point where I'm uncomfortable out in the duck woods, and it's just not working. She said, well, I have a solution for you, but I don't think you're going to want to do it. I said, why don't you try me? She said, pantyhose. <laughs> and I said, there's no way. I may not be the man's man, and I don't care what NFL quarterback wears pantyhose in the middle of winter on the football field. I'm not that guy. Well, that evening we went to the store and I got out of the car and I thought, it is already cold. I can't imagine how cold it's going to be out in the duck woods the next morning. So we walked in the store and I laid my man card on the table and I looked at her and I said, what size do you think I wear? <laughs> so we headed over to the pantyhose section and she grabbed a couple of packs and she handed them to me and I said, I don't know why, but I said, is there any other colors besides those? And she said, seriously, who's going to see these? Little did she know, the next day when I'm lying on the ground dying and my friend is pulling clothes off of me, he literally steps back and says, why are you wearing pantyhose? <laughs> and I mumbled something about my wife and he continued to help me. But also, not only was that tree there in the Lord's providence, there was something else that was there in the Lord's providence that day. There was a, a friend that I did a lot of fishing with, and he was parked there that morning, and I recognized his truck, and he was actually out hunting with his boys. And every time we fished, he would take his truck keys and put them in the gas lid of his truck. And I always thought to myself, that is so bizarre. Why would he do that? Now in hindsight, I look back, it was brilliant. 
because we opened that gas lid and sure enough the keys were there and I got in my friend's truck and turned it on and sat there for an hour and a half thawing out while my buddy's wife brought him a spare set of keys to be able to get us home. Now, of course, I had to explain to my other friend the next day when I saw him why he went fishing with a full tank of gas and came back, and there was only a quarter of a tank left in the truck. But the day ended with a really nice fellow in a flat-bottom boat who paddled me back out to that tree so that I could retrieve my shotgun out of the tree. I got to tell you, that was the absolute worst day of my life. In all of my 40 years, that is number one on the list. I mean, it was a day that was marked with struggle, tension, strife, toil, worry, helplessness, and most of all, insecurity. I had no idea if I was going to make it out of there alive. Now, I share this in a lighthearted way because it reminds me of something that may be a bit more heavy-hearted upon you this morning. You may have worry and fear and doubt and most of all, insecurity about the very most important thing about you, your salvation in Jesus Christ. You feel stranded, you feel cold, you feel alone, and you're looking for any type of emotional experience that you've had in church to muster up some type of false assurance just to get you to the next day, just so that you can sleep tonight and serve Christ tomorrow. But let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ... He is the keeper of your soul. He will rescue you. And what he has started in you, he is going to bring to completion. Rest assured, the words of John chapter 10 are coming. And they're coming to lend a tender hand to hearts that feel insecure this morning. So I want to invite you to stand with me in the honor of the reading of the word of God. John chapter 10, we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 30. And the irony here is as we stand in reverence of this text, we are all in a moment going to sit in humility because we understand exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to us. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. You may be seated. May God bless the preaching of his word this morning. Over the past year, I have saturated myself in the security text because my soul has desperately needed it. And I think for many of you, your soul needs it as well. Texts like Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Jude, verse 24, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, which consequently I preached a few sermons ago from this pulpit last year, and particularly and especially here in John 10, 27 through 30. Each of these texts work together in harmony together to provide a clear doctrine under what we would call our soteriology. Now that's just a $5 word for the study of salvation. But underneath the study of soteriology, there are a lot of truths that we must unpack. And one is found in all of these verses. It's a clear argument for the doctrine of eternal security or the security of the believer, or my favorite description of this doctrine, the perseverance of the saints. And what this means is once you become a believer in Christ, you will always be a believer in Christ. There is no one, there is no thing at any time that can separate you or take you away from your salvation in Christ. Now let's step back and gain some context of what we're going to be looking here at John 10, 27 through 30, by backing up into verses 22 through 26. See here, the Pharisees are trying to put Jesus in a predicament again. They're trying to ask him public questions in front of crowds to get him to say something that would give them justification to take his life. But here's the deal. No one took Jesus' life. Throughout John chapter 10, we see he was not a victim. He voluntarily and willingly laid down his life. John 10, verse 11, 15, 17, and 18, Jesus says unanimously, I lay down my life. He laid down his life for us upon the cross for our sins. Now this is all happening in the midst of this conversation during a feast known as the Feast of the Dedication. 
Now, if you were to flip through your Old Testament, you're not going to find the Feast of the Dedication there because it was started in what's known as the intertestamental period. This is the time of 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. We also call this time the years of silence because there were no scriptures being written. There were no prophetic words being spoken. And during this time of silence, there was a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes from Syria who invaded Jerusalem. And as he invaded Jerusalem, he did the worst thing. He desecrated the temple where the sacrifices were made and where the Israelites worshipped. In fact, he even sacrificed a pig on the altar of God. Now, if you've ever wondered if we have a God that is patient and forbearing, the simple fact that he allowed this man to take a breath after he did that should let you know how patient and forbearing our God is. And if you're here this morning and you haven't repented and turned to Christ, it's because we have a patient, forbearing God that is giving you opportunity to do so. Please do not test his patience because his forbearance will run out one day. Well, there was a family who became exhausted of this Judas Maccabeus and his families rose up and decided over the next couple of years through a variety of guerrilla warfare tactics to take back Jerusalem. And sure enough, they did. And this account is recorded in what's known as the Apocrypha, which is a group of books that were written in this intertestamental time. However, they're not scriptural. Even though some might put them in their Bibles in between the Old and New Testament, the early church did not see the Apocrypha as inspired. They're more historical, which is where we learn this. And the Feast of Dedication was set aside, which we're reading here in this text, to remember these events during the time in Jerusalem. You might know this more familiarly today as Hanukkah, or the Festival of Lights that some of our Jewish friends celebrate during this time of year. It's also unique, not only this celebration, but particularly when this celebration is happening. If you'll look at verse 22, it tells us the time of year in John chapter 10 when the Feast of Dedication is occurring. It's winter time. And on the calendar, that's mid-December. And this is the rainy and cold and windy season. And then in verse 23, it tells us where Jesus is at. He's on Solomon's porch. Now, some of your scriptures may say colonnade or portico. This is on the east side of the temple. And Jesus could go here in the midst of this conversation that we just saw with the Pharisees to be sheltered from the cold and the weather. But there's more to it than just that. Many commentators believe that winter is mentioned here not only as the time of year, but really an illustration of the hearts of the people of Israel. Gerald Boucher writes, the thoughtful reader of the gospel understands the time and temperature notations in John are reflections of the spiritual condition of the persons in the story. See, the people of Israel, and particularly the Pharisees, their hearts had grown cold, dead, and hard to the things of the Lord Jesus. And I don't know if you're having winter in your heart right now, but when you hear the word of God, when we sing the songs, when we gather corporately as a church, are you cold and hard and dead to the things of the Lord? Has winter produced that season in your heart? And we see this because Jesus is very frank with these people. In verses 25 and 26, he tells them twice, you do not believe in me. And then in verse 26, it is the crescendo of what these people need to hear. He says, you are not among my sheep. This is why you don't believe in me. Now, you may be sitting there and you may say, wow, Jesus sounds really harsh. Well, if I had a soapbox, I would pull it out from behind the pulpit, set it down, and step up onto it for a moment. Jesus may sound harsh, But what Jesus is doing this morning is he is being as loving as he could ever be to these people because he's doing this one vital thing that we need to do as believers, speaking the truth. And Christians, I've seen so many brothers and sisters in Christ who have cowered down in these days who are fearful to speak the truth the truth. They are so afraid of what the world is going to think about us if we speak the truth. Hey, newsflash, Jesus told us what the world's going to think about us. He said, if they hate me, which they did, they're going to hate you. And so here's what we must do. We must give the world the thing that they don't want to hear but need the most, the truth. It doesn't mean that we have to do it in a bombastic or brash manner, but we must give them the truth wrapped in boldness and love. 
Now, let me pull that soapbox back behind the pulpit and step back down because I can make a whole sermon out of that and dig back into the text together. And so these so-called harsh but actually loving words are followed by some of the most comforting passages of Scripture that you're ever going to read if you are a member of Christ's flock today. This passage that we read and that we're going to break down, it's like shade in the sun. It's an oasis in the desert. It's sleep for the insomniac. It's medicine for your pain. It's prescription lenses for your blurry eyes. It's a well that doesn't run dry. It's a warm blanket on a cold, wet day. And in these next four verses, we're going to be answering this question together as Jesus tells us the answer to this question. And the question is this, what kind of salvation do we have? Jesus says here, I'm going to tell you what kind of salvation we have. So let's look together in verse 27. Number one, we see that our salvation is personal. We have a personal salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he says here. My sheep hear my voice. Now Christ has already utilized this terminology throughout chapter 10. If you look at verse 3, he's using the analogy of the shepherd and the sheep. And he says, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. Verse 4, he continues that. They know his voice. And then in verse 16 of chapter 10, he applies the analogy to himself and says, they will listen to my voice. Here's the truth. There is power in the shepherd's voice to call his sheep. Now, in the context of this passage, it has been misapplied in many Christian circles. This is not sitting around listening for the mystical voice of God to tell you what you're supposed to do. He has spoken clearly and concisely to us through the Word of God. This is the voice of God calling people to salvation through the presentation of the gospel. I want you to imagine for a moment that we're all sitting in a revival service, and the evangelist is preaching a fiery presentation of the gospel. And at the end of it, he gives an invitation for everyone in the room to repent of their sins and to believe upon Jesus Christ. Now, at that moment, everyone in the room heard that invitation. That's what we would call a general call. Everyone heard it. But as you're sitting there in the service, you realize not everyone has responded to that call. But where you're sitting in your seat, in your heart of hearts, you begin to feel your sin. You begin to feel the weight of it. You begin to know that you've sinned against God and you deserve the wrath of God put down on you. So you are being convicted by the Holy Spirit, but he also gives you clarity to know that Jesus Christ died for that sin. He absorbed that wrath for you. And if you will believe in him, he will wipe away your sins, save you and forgive you, and you will become one of his Inside of you that day, that's not just the general call. That's what we would call the effectual call. It's called effectual because it's effective. God will do what he wills through his message and through his spirit working in the heart of a person. Have you experienced that call? You may hear it today. Have you answered that call? If not, why not? And it's not an audible voice. It's not something you're going to hear out loud. But here it is. It is the loudest voice that you're ever going to hear deep into your heart and soul. There's another aspect to this personal salvation that we have. In verse 27, Jesus says to them, I know them. In verse 14, this is something that he's repeated because he says, I know my own and my own know me. See, Jesus, the good shepherd, as he's referred to in chapter 10, knows his sheep personally. He's not like those cold, dead, distant, false, fake gods that we read about, that we hear about in the pagan religions. I mean, do you think Muhammad knows his followers? No. Do you think Buddha knows his followers? Absolutely not. Do you think Confucius knows his followers? Of course not. There is only one who is living and reigning and knows his followers, and his name is Jesus. The word know here in verse 27 is from the Greek word gnosko, And the verb know is not just knowing about someone, it is knowing someone intimately and personally. And Jesus knows all of his sheep intimately and personally. I mean, just think about where you sit with the billions of people on the planet right now. There is eternal, sovereign, majestic, glorious God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, seeks to know you 
personally and intimately. Jesus' sheep, they hear his voice and they know him. And verse 27 tells us the result of hearing his voice, responding to it and knowing him and he knowing you. What does it say? They follow him. Now, Martin Luther is clear from the Reformation. He says, we're not saved by good works, but we are saved to do good works. The point is the sheep tread in the footsteps of the shepherd. The simple fact that you've heard the voice of God and you've responded and you know him and he knows you, the natural outpouring in response to that is to follow him. Following him in obedience is not what saves you, but it is the fruit from the root of hearing his voice and knowing him. It wasn't uncommon for a shepherd in this day to brand their sheep. They would put brands on their ear and feet so that they could mark whose sheep they were. The Puritans connected that to us as believers. They would say that we were branded by the good shepherd on our ear and our feet because you notice in this passage, the ears and the feet are mentioned as parts of our body. Let me just ask you again, have your ears heard the shepherd effectually calling you to salvation? Have you answered that call? If not, why not? What are you waiting on? He has green pastures for you and his flock. But are your feet assuring you of the salvation that he has given you because you're walking in obedience to him? So first, we have a personal salvation, don't we? But secondly, from this text, our salvation is not only personal, but number two, our salvation is permanent. Look at the first part of verse 28. Jesus says these words, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Now, eternal life, by the very definition of it, cannot be taken away because it is a forever type of life. Remember, you're not on contract with the Lord. If you could be saved 10 years and lose that salvation, you wouldn't have eternal life. What kind of life would you have? 10-year life. You would only have a decade of life, not eternal life. We have a permanent salvation. Now, Jesus says here, and it's very important to notice this, I give. It's not I will give. This is written in the original Greek in the continuous tense, the present tense, which means it's an action that just keeps on going. We don't receive eternal life later. When do we receive it? Right now. Adrian Rogers spoke of this in a sermon. He said, everlasting life, it's not something you get when you die. Everlasting life is something you get when you believe. It's not waiting until you die to find out if you have it. For us who are in the flock of Christ, we're not on trial awaiting the verdict. It is done. We are innocent. We have been made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we're in his flock. And eternal life starts the moment you hear his voice and know him. Just listen to what he says in verse 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came so that they will have life? No, no, no. Present tense, they may have life. Because the opposite of eternal life is mentioned in this verse. It's perishing, which is eternal death. And what does the Lord say to his sheep here? See, because we have a very real place called hell. And it is conscious, and it is eternal, and it is reserved for all of us who deserve it, which is every single person who has ever lived. But the Lord has been so kind and gracious that he has made a way for us to escape hell and spend eternity in heaven with him. And this is what he says about his sheep. They will never perish. In other words, if you're one of his sheep, you're not going to hell. I mean, seriously, step back and just take a deep breath for a moment and think about that. You are not going to hell. It is not reserved for you anymore. Now, inevitably, someone's going to ask, and rightly so, because when I hit on this topic last year in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, many came up and said, what about those who received Christ and then walked away? Surely they had their salvation and gave it back, forfeited it, or the Lord took it away by something that they did. And we live in a day where we're telling people, do this outwardly thing, follow these three steps, and you're saved, and then we're not going to watch your life, and if you produce no fruit at all, that's okay, because we're going to keep telling you that you're saved because you did these outwardly things. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. Mark chapter 4 with the parable of the sower is clear. We know if someone is saved because their life will bear fruit, and I would answer that is that they have never been saved in the first place. 
And John would say the same thing in his epistle in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Now that's a tongue twister, but what John is saying is if they go away and they stay away, they were never saved. Even though some Baptists have abused the perseverance of the saints, it's never been intended to be a license to sin. And if someone would believe or live that way, go back and check the fruit because it's barren. It's not there. As believers, we are going to veer off the path, aren't we? But a true believer, even though he or she will veer off because we are still in the flesh and we still sin, we will come back. The proof of our salvation is we finish the race that God began in and through us. We will come back. The Holy Spirit residing in all of our hearts, he will convict us of our sin. He will draw us to repentance. In the time that we're resistant to him, Hebrews is clear. God disciplines those whom he loves. He will take his children to the woodshed and wear them out to teach us a lesson for his glory and for our good. One of the hallmark texts is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14 and talking about eternal security. And speaking of the Holy Spirit, it says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. This verse is showing the permanency of our salvation. Paul says here, the Holy Spirit, he's our guarantee. You could write that down in all caps. Your salvation will happen. The Holy Spirit is guaranteeing it. He's our earnest money, our pledge, our engagement ring. We are committed. He is not pulling out of this deal. If you notice early in the text in verse 5 and verse 8, Jesus says what his true sheep are going to do in these type of situations when there's an opportunity to go away. In verse 5, he says they're not going to follow a stranger. They're not going to listen to the voice of a stranger. They don't know it. In verse 8, he said, thieves and robbers will come before me. My sheep aren't going to listen to them. We have a personal salvation, but praise be to God, we also have a permanent salvation. And thirdly, number three, our salvation is protected. We have a protected salvation. Look at the second part of verse 28. Jesus says these words, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, it's interesting here. Let's jump ahead just a bit to the second part of verse 29. He says, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. The word snatch in both of these verses comes from the Greek word, and it's translated with the sense of seizing, carrying away, and grabbing with force. And we look, the enemy, the world, and our own flesh are seeking to come at us with force to pull us away from Christ. And Christ says, when that happens, you're in my sovereign grip. And it would take somebody prying open the sovereign hand of God to get to you. Who can pry open the sovereign hand of God? It would take a hand stronger than his, and no hand exists in time and in eternity. And so what this means is not only are we in Christ's hands, but we're also in the Father's hands, we are doubly secured. We are doubly protected. When my daughter was small, I would take a piece of candy or a small toy, and I would put it in my hand, and I would hold on to it, and she would try to pry open my fingers to get to it. She never could. Now, tomorrow, she starts her senior year. It's now car keys and $20 bills, and she could just rip my hand off to get to those things. But when she was younger, if I were to put that in my hand and then I were to put my other hand on it, whatever's in my hand is never going to see a crack of light. She's not getting to it. And the point here is that is how our salvation is protected by God. That's how personal the salvation is. And because he protects it in that way, that's how personal it is. That's how permanent it is. Verses 28 and 29, you notice the two words there. It says, who can get you? No one. No one. Do you know what the word no one means in the original Greek? No one. (laughs) No one's going to get to you. Our salvation is covered by Christ. It is guarded by God. We have a personal, a permanent, a protected, and fourthly, our salvation is a possession. And we have to go back to the beginning of verse 29 to understand this concept and to flesh it out a bit. But as we look, Jesus says here, my father who has given them to me. Now, who is the them here? Well, it's the sheep, it's believers, it's Christians. And we as Christians, we are possessions of Christ. He owns us. We are his. 
he's not our co-pilot. He's in the driver's seat. We're in the back seat. He's telling us where to go. He's calling the shots. And what we see here is God the Father giving believers to God the Son as a gift, as a love gift. In Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, it's littered with this reality. Here are just a couple to note. In verse 9, he says, those whom you have given me. In verse 11 of John 17, he says, keep them in your name, which you have given me. In verse 24, he says it again, whom you have given me. As Christ is praying for his disciples in John 17 before the cross and by extension praying for us, do you realize that prayer hasn't stopped? In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, in referring to Christ, it says this, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. I mean, just think at this very moment, the good shepherd is praying, interceding for each and every one of his sheep. Do you think that one of Jesus' intercessions will fail? Do you think that one of his prayers for his sheep is going to fall? No, not a one. You know, we lose stuff all the time, don't we? Sometimes we lose something and we might find it, and sometimes we lose something and it is gone forever. When we lived in Fort Worth, when I was in seminary, we rented a small apartment, and I was coming home one night, and I was loaded down with stuff, and I unlocked the door to the apartment, the deadbolt and the regular lock, and I went inside, spent some time with Katie and Emily. The night passed, did a few things around the apartment. I went to bed. I got up the next day to repeat. Well, as I was getting ready to leave, I gathered all of my stuff. I grabbed my bag, and I was headed out the door. But as I was getting ready to head out the door, I realized I couldn't find my keys anywhere. And so I checked my pockets from the night before. They're not there. I checked my backpack. I checked the cushions on the couch. I am tearing the apartment up and down trying to find these keys. Finally, I get a spare set because I've got to go. And I start to head out the door. And as I'm heading out the door, I go to grab the handle to shut it and lock it. And I realize the entire night I left the keys in the lock. Now, at that moment, there was a great deal of relief that I found the keys. But I was also a bit petrified because I realized somebody could have grabbed the keys and stole my car. I left my family vulnerable to somebody coming in. And I think for far too long, some of you, and I've done this, You've been living your salvation as if that's how Christ is holding the keys to your heart. He's never going to lose you. He's never going to misplace you. He's never going to leave you unattended, unsecured, unlocked. Some of the shepherds in this time, they would put their sheep out to people known as hired hands. And you can see that in verses 12 and 13. He who is a hired hand, Jesus says, they don't own the sheep. They don't care about the sheep. When a wolf comes in, they flee because they love themselves more than the sheep. Let me tell you something. Jesus is not your hired hand. He's never going to farm you out. He's never going to subcontract your soul to anyone. Have you ever been into a business and you've been helped by the employee versus the owner in the midst of a problem? You notice how many times the owner is going to care for you so much more meticulously in all of the details. Christ is not an employee of your soul. He is the owner of of it. You are his if you are in him. Jesus the good shepherd never loses a sheep and when one wanders off as we referenced, he does exactly what he says of the shepherd in the parable of Luke chapter 15. He leaves the 99, searches and grabs the one and brings it back. What can misplace us from Christ? Hope you got the gist of it. It's nothing and no one. But if you don't believe me in the text I've used, listen to what Paul says. In Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, Paul lists every possible circumstance under heaven, on earth, that could separate us from Christ. And then at the end, he says, not a one of them will do it. Not one. We go back to that hallmark text from Ephesians 1 on the security of the believer. Instead of verse 14, in verse 13 here, Paul says that when we believed in him, that is Christ, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, in ancient times, the monarchy, they would seal royal documents. And as they sealed these documents, they would take the king's ring, press it into wax, put it into the document. And that did a few things. It showed the authority of the king. It showed the possession of what was going on and what the exchange was going to be about with this document. But it also was irrevocable. You couldn't take it back. And this is what God has done for us in our salvation. We are imprinted with the king's ring when we come into the flock of Christ. 
We are his. Our salvation is irrevocable. It's guarded by God. It is covered by Christ. And we see here, it's sealed by the Spirit. I love what W.A. Criswell said in arguing for this doctrine. He asked, can you unborn your children? Some of you might say, if you know how they acted yesterday, I would be looking for a way to find out. It's the same in the kingdom. How do we get into the kingdom? We're born into it. We cannot be born out of it. We never see an instance in Scripture where someone is unborn as God's child. We also never see an instance where someone is saved twice. If that was the case, Jesus would have to come down from heaven, climb back up on the cross, and be crucified again. His once-for-all sacrifice is all-sufficient for salvation. Amen, and praise God for that. Our salvation is personal, it's permanent, it's protected, it's a possession. And fifthly and finally, in verse 30, we see our salvation is a person. That's the kind of salvation we have. It is found totally, completely, and fully in the person of Jesus Christ. Look what Jesus says in verse 30. I and the Father are one. Now, it's important to look at the word one here because it's written in the original Greek in the neuter form, not the masculine form. Now, why is that important? It's important because Jesus is making an emphatic point. He is saying that I and the Father, we're of the same essence, but we're not the same person. And that's even more important because Jesus is saying the Father doesn't turn into the Son, and the Son turn into the Spirit, and the Spirit turn back into the Son and back into the Father. That's called modalism, and that's heresy, and it was declared heresy in church history early in the church. The Trinity is one, but with three distinct, co-equal, co-eternal members found completely in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can I explain all that? Absolutely not. But I love trying to plumb the depths of it. Simply put, Jesus is making a claim to be of the same essence as the Father, which he's saying, I'm divine. He is proclaiming his deity. Now, if there's any doubt in your mind about that, just look at what happens in verses 31 through 33. When Jesus says this, the people were pretty upset. Not about the things that he so much did, but by what he said. His claim to deity and divinity is clear because here's their response. They pick up stones to stone him. And as they're prepared to stone him, they call him blasphemous. But here's the irony. They were the blasphemous ones that day because they accused Jesus of being something less than he was. And if you accuse Jesus of being anything less than God, you're being blasphemous. So when you meet someone, someone comes to your door, and you want to know what they believe, real quickly, just figure out what they believe about Jesus, and that's going to tell you what you need to know. If they believe that Jesus was not God, he was created, or he's only a part of salvation, bottom line, in love I say this, they are not Christians, period, the end. See, if Jesus was not who he says he was, I'm going to pack up and go home. In fact, I'm going to stop right now walk off the platform, go get in my car and do something else. I mean, there's a lake out there just begging you to go fish it. I mean, there's a buffet wanting you to belly up to it and just gorge yourself. Television series wanting you to go home and binge watch it. There's got to be a trail out there just waiting for me to hike it. There's got to be so many other things I could go and do. Because Jesus is either who he said he was or he is not. And that is the divine hinge on what we do rest. Salvation isn't found in a place you go, a possession you own, a performance that you offer to God, a program you attend, salvation is found in a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. And this could not be possible if he and the Father, here in verse 30, were not one. This is why we don't look to ourselves to keep our salvation. We look to the author, the perfecter, that finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. So the only way for us to lose it if he goes down and Christ isn't going anywhere. Our salvation is personal. It's permanent. It's protected. It's a possession and it's a person. Now as we conclude this morning, I've prayerfully considered some implications from this text. Now where you sit, the Holy Spirit would work inside of you to show you how to specifically apply this text to your life. But I want to share a few insights that have helped me, and I hope that there'll be an encouragement and challenge to you as well. First, even though this has been shared often, it's worth sharing one more time in a condensed manner. When they were constructing the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, 
It is said that 23 people fell down into the rocky bay to their death. So the managers of the project got together and constructed a huge net that cost over $100,000 to help protect the men as they put it under the bridge as they worked up top. And it was said, it's reported, that only 10 people fell into that net for the rest of the project. And they finished the project in 25% faster time, knowing the safety that sat underneath them. The same is true for us. I mean, as we serve the Lord, he's got a safety net under us. It's called eternal security. And when this glorious doctrine finds its way into your heart, you're going to be so productive for the Lord. You're going to serve him with such joy and confidence, not because you feel like you have to, but goodness gracious, you're going to want to. So let me ask you, have you pondered, have you rested in the perseverance of the saints? Just watch what it's going to do for you. You're going to find that you're not looking at yourself, but you're keeping your eyes on Jesus as the one who takes care of your salvation. Secondly, every church, even ours, we can run the risk of being a church with a drawbridge. When we gather together, we pull that drawbridge up and no one else can come on in because we're surrounded by a moat and they can't get here. And we want the church to be focused on building up believers, but we also want the church to do what Christ has called it to do through the commission, and that's to reach the nations. And I say that to say there's lost sheep out there. There's lost sheep in your neighborhood, lost sheep at your schools, lost sheep at work. There's lost sheep in our communities. And we don't always know who these lost sheep are. But here's what I do know. Christ has left us here as his sheep to go and bear and share the gospel message with those who have yet to come. And as we go, God will use us living and speaking the gospel in their lives to do that effectual call in their heart. God uses his people through his message to reach those who have not yet come to him. So let me ask you, how might God use you this week to help draw someone into his flock? Thirdly, this is kind of what I started with and hinted at at the beginning. Uh, There's some of you, you feel insecure in your faith. You are desperately in need of the assurance of your salvation. In John 14, Jesus tells us, for all those who are his, he's going to prepare a place, and he's going to come back and get you and take you to that place. In my neighborhood, they've been doing a lot of construction. Somebody will buy a house, they'll tear it down, and then they'll build a big one in its place. Sometimes these houses sell pretty quickly, but other times they sit vacant for a long time, and you can't help but wonder as you look out your window, who is my new neighbor going to be? Let me tell you, in heaven, there's going to be no vacant lots. There's going to be no empty mansions. And that includes yours. If you've come to Christ, he's going to make sure you get home. So if you believe in him, let me just tell you, don't sit on your laurels and not push and strive to walk in obedience to him, but just sleep well tonight because he's got you. He's got you. Are you looking to yourself or Christ? as the keeper of your salvation. And then lastly, can't end a message without saying this. There may be some of you here, you've not answered that call from the shepherd to come into the flock. Back in verse seven, Jesus says, I am the door for the sheep. Some of your versions may say gate. And in these Eastern sheep pens, it would be almost a full circle except one opening. And the shepherd would sleep in that opening. So no one would come into the flock unless it was through him. Well, back to John 14, Jesus says it's through him and only through him that we get to the Father. This morning, you may feel it. Everybody's hearing it, but internally you feel God working and drawing and the shepherd calling you to come into the flock. If that is you, don't wait. Don't delay. Come. Come, we're not coming down front, but what will happen is in a moment, there will be pastors available in the lobby. Any way that we can encourage you in the assurance of your faith, pray for a lost friend that you want into the flock or to help you know how you can come into the fold through Jesus Christ. Won't you come? Bow your heads, please. I wanna close with a brief prayer. And we'll continue worshiping not just through the word, but through song together. Father, this is such an encouraging text. And I know we have some afflicted people here this morning. So I pray that you would use your text to comfort the afflicted. 
But we might have some that are just too comfortable this morning. So God, I pray that you would use this text to afflict the comfortable, to draw them to a place in which they can find you. So Father, for the one who is outside of the sheep pen and they hear the shepherd's voice this morning, would it be louder than anything else they can hear? Would you use that to draw them in? Would you help them to come to faith in Jesus Christ? to have the courage to come and speak to someone, to turn from their sin and to believe upon you. Others, Lord, they just struggle with the truths of this doctrine. And God, I pray that they would see it biblically and how it squares biblically with what you do and how we're supposed to live. And God, give them such joy and confidence in their faith because of what you have done that we could not do for ourselves. Others, Lord, this morning, they just need the assurance They just need to know. And God, testify to them through your word, through other saints, and through your spirit, Lord, that they are in Christ and you will finish what you started in them. And finally, for those sheep who have not yet to come in, melt, break, soften our hearts for them. Don't let it be winter in our hearts to be cold and dead and hard to those who do not know you. God, let us open the drawbridge to our hearts, to our lives, to this church, into the community for those who have yet to come to Christ. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. May you be glorified. Amen. Church, would you stand with us as we respond to worship? Praise the Lord. His mercy is more.
had to uh, get into the service today, but we've done you a favor. If you got out at 1030, you'd have gotten to your restaurant, sat in your car for 30 minutes. Okay, so we helped you out this morning. We have one more thing I want us to do this morning before we leave. I'm going to ask if you are an educator or a student about to go back to school, if you would stand. Uh, we're not going to surround you, but we want you to stand where we can see you, teachers, administrators, students. All right, we want to pray for you this morning. Uh, before we go, uh, let me remind those of you online, you can pray for a student there in your home or a teacher or someone you know. Let me remind you that we are going to be this afternoon praying at different schools. Uh, Luann and I are going to be at uh, Salem at 3 and Bethel at 345. But there's schedule, there's prayer guides out there and online as well. Hope you'll join us in praying uh, for these that are going back to school tomorrow and for these educators. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we do thank you for these teachers, these educators, for them committing their lives to helping students. And Father, we thank you especially for these teachers and educators who are disciples of Christ, who are Christians, who are followers. And God, you know some of the tension they, faced in, they, they face in living out their faith on that campus. So I pray you just give them wisdom and that you would provide opportunity. Father, for these students, as they go back to school, we ask for your protection over them, your protection physically, your protection spiritually, your protection over their minds. And Father, I thank you that in this nation, students have great freedom. And so I pray that these students who are Christ's followers would remember that they are missionaries that you have placed on that campus. They're not at that school because of where they live or because of choice. They're in that place because you have put them there. And Father, I pray that you would use them on their campuses this year to make a significant impact for Christ, to be a light. Father, for all of us who belong to you, that's your calling on us to let our light shine. And I ask that this week you'd help us to be faithful in that so we can advance the kingdom and the cause of the gospel. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us online today as we had the chance to worship together at Geyer Springs. If you're a regular attender, we invite you to text GSFBC to 94000. You'll get some response back that will cue you in on how you can get more information about what's going on right here at Geyer Springs. If you're a guest, we invite you to text the word DISCOVER to 94000 and you'll have the opportunity to get another response and put in some information that will help us be able to serve you and minister to you in the days ahead. We love the fact that you're with us online. We hope that if you're able to be with us in person, you'll consider that as well. But until next time, we love you guys and we'll see you soon.